Thank you, Pam. Just want to also say um, congratulations to Marshall and Rayanna Harder as um, they recently got married. What day was it that they, it was yesterday. So big congrats to them. And uh, Robin and Jaira are getting married later on today. So I guess it's a pre-congrats to them, but it's coming fast. Anyway, which is super exciting. Um, at this time, I'm going to do the Bible reading, and then we'll spend a little time in prayer. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Revelation chapter 21, and I'll be reading um, verses 1 through 6, or halfway through 6. Revelation 21, starting at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne, saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be with his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished.
I'm sure, I am sure that all of you have at one time or another, even maybe even quite recently, have come upon a task that was called upon for you to do and uh, And uh, after you had done the task, you kind of, well, that's done. Yeah, you've been there. Uh, high schoolers, now you're going to start, you're going to start school, but come April, May, then you're going to be looking forward to the end where you're going to be able to wipe your hands and say, well, that's done. And, and with that, of course, there's the hope that it really is for that year. Jake, I know he's, he's got one thing in his mind, and I know his vocation is such that, that uh, when he pours concrete and he's uh, uh, troweling and, and he sees the blue clouds on the west coming and forming and billowing up, and then, and then he's working like a fury to get this thing done, and, and, uh, and then when it is finally done and the rain hasn't come yet, and, and he can wipe his hands and say, well, whew, got her done. Got it on. Uh, I think the farmers are that way inclined too. Right now, they're still fairly early in the harvest, but I am sure there is the time coming, and it's not very far long from today where the farmers are going to be just waiting for the day when everything is done. The grain is in the granary, and it's safe, and all that kind of stuff, and and so forth and so on. I have encountered it sometimes. I remember, I, I know that there are times when my good wife has told me something to do. And, and she's told me often and for a long time, can you get her done? Would you get it done? That needs to be done. And then the reminders keep getting fewer and fewer and you know that's not a good sign. <laughs> finally, you do it, and you shake it. Oh, I finally got that done. And so you go to her and say, I got it done. And she comes and looks at it, and she says, it's all wrong. <laughs> ah, maybe it isn't that way. We might have had some things where we may have, we may have come to the, to the idea, well, now that is done, but maybe I'll have to go back and do some modifying. Maybe, maybe I didn't get it quite all done. I remember talking to a farmer <laughs> not too long ago, well, it was in spring, actually, and, and, and I came to church, and he said, I got it done. And uh, did you get it all done? And he said, well, I got about 50 acres left, but... Uh, no, no, what we're talking about today, it is done. It's finished. And we want to look today at some places in Scripture, in the Word, where we encounter those words. It's done. But before we go any further, would you join me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us and for your Word and for the words, it is done. Lord, as we look into the words and speak about these things, Father, we ask for liberty, graciousness, and then for clarity. Yeah, that's what we need. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There is uh, probably uh, quite a few instances in Scripture where we, where we read about uh, something that is done. It is finished. And I want to start off right for, at the beginning. And, you're, and, and you, you probably maybe would have figured that this is where you would start. Uh, creation, Re creation. The first day, let there be, uh, let there be light. And God saw that the light was good. And then the next day, God separated waters from the earth, the sky. Oh, yes. And then the third day, he collected the waters in certain places so the ground could appear. And he looked at it, and, and, and God saw that it was good. And then a little bit later, the, he puts light in the sky, the sun and the moon, and, 
and I think it is in verse 12, and God saw that it was good. And then he made the expense, the light in the sky and sun and moon, that had to happen. And then he put living creatures in the seas, and it was good. And he put the created creatures for land, and that was good. But that was the sixth day, and then the afternoon of the sixth day, he was going to make man. And scripture doesn't say anything about whether that was good or not. Maybe he had to do some modifying on that one. And the answer to that is no. No, it was, there, there was no need for modification. We come to verse 31. And, and, he, and it says here, and God, this is chapter 1, I don't know if I said that. God saw that all he had made, all that he had made, and it was very good. And that was the evening, and there was morning, and that was the sixth day. It was finished. It was done. It was good. Chapter 2, we start off with cha chapter 2, and it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. It was done. Creation was done. There was no need to go back and, and, and finish up some quarters some corners and, and tidy up something and, and, re and uh, recalculate some calculations and stuff like that. No, when he was finished, he was finished. It was good. It was very, matter of fact, he says it was very good. Now, if that was the end of the story, but it isn't the end of the story, is it? But we'll go to the second instance where we read about something that is finished. And we turn to Revelations chapter 15. I want to read a couple of verses there. Revelations chapter 15, verses 1. We know that Revelation is the book of end, end times. And where we start off to this morning, we realize that an awful lot of things have happened. And we have witnessed the very heavy hand of God. We read this. And I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Seven angels with seven last plagues. Last? Because with them, listen, and look, look at this carefully. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. It's finished. And if we didn't know the rest of the story, if we didn't know what happened between then at the very beginning and now, we would uh, wonder, what the heck has happened? What is going on? But you and I, of course, know what has happened. Seven angels, seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. Something happened. Something happened that now all of a sudden we are encountering the wrath or we're reading about the wrath of God and it is such that we are looking forward to the end of that wrath to come. We go back to Genesis and find out, of course, and you and I know that story very well. It was shortly after the, the end of creation that, that the, the devil comes along and he tempts Eve and, and sin, sin is introduced to his creation. And right then and there, we see the wrath of God displayed. And it had something to do, it had something to do with disobedience, and there were warnings, warnings of consequences. You and I know that story well, well from Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Disobedience, that was not going to be tolerated. And yet, Adam and Eve did just that. The devil had, had a lot to do with that. And, and of course, God, he... What does he do? Turns to Adam and he says, you're going to have trouble all the days of your life. 
Eve, you're going to be barren children, but that is not going to go well. And then, of course, he turns to the serpent, and, of course, we know that story as well. The hand of God, the heavy hand of God. Man is an, uh, escorted from the garden, banished from the garden, and man from that time on would live with that curse over his head. There is death. God had said, you do this, die. Death is what you have. And it didn't take long. Matter of fact, it only was the next chapter in Scripture. We go very shortly into the new creation and we find something that mankind experienced and they didn't have television to even encourage Abel to kill his brother. How did that happen? We, of course, we, 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 we have a tendency, and, and excuse me, we have a tendency to blame television, and television is something to be blamed. But where did Cain get the idea that, idea that he was going to kill his brother Abel? Where did that come from? That animosity, that hate and, hatred and stuff like that. Well, it came from sin that had entered into the universe, into creation. And God had said, you will die. And mankind from since that day on lived with this hanging over their heads, our heads. All of creation would feel his anger. Death, decay, rot. It is good. It is very good. Had been modified. Greatly modified. All we have to learn, go is go, turn to Romans chapter 8 and 19 and 20 and we read there how, how creation groans. Why? Because of sin. And it groans because there's the wrath of God to be reckoned with. The Bible is full of stories. Man, with all his ingenuity and devising of different ways and means of sinning and defying God. And not only defying God, but then also perpetrating all kinds of evil and dastardly things toward his fellow creation, his fellow man. We read stories all over the place in the Old Testament. Man desperately needs. Something to happen that would bring an end to all these things. It seems, and we read at times when it seems like, like God is coming to the end of himself. We read about the flood. There was all kinds of... Man was eternally, or forevermore, man was devising and thinking of a way, ways of sinning. Sin was always there. His ever thought was for sin and doing evil. And of course, God brought the flood. We see the wrath of God there. And the wrath of God is not only toward the sin that man so displays so effortlessly and so completely. But we also see the introduction of sin and what that has done to his creation. If you would have been in Sunday school this morning, you would have, we, you, you would have uh, heard about uh, the story in Mark chapter 1, is it? Chapter 1. And, uh, and where we read where this leper comes to Jesus and says, if you are willing. I know you can make me clean, but if you are willing, and, and it says there that God had compassion compassion and the idea there the the word compassion has the idea of anger anger N not a hateful or a, an anger that would lash out per se but it was an anger because i think jesus saw what sin had done to mankind 
to his creation and he saw this man coming to him with leprosy. Are you willing? I know you are able, but are you willing to heal? And, and Jesus saw what sin had done. I am willing. And he told the man to pick up his, or he'd be cleaned. Here in Revelations, and we want to look at Revelations chapter 16, actually, and when we come to Revelation, we, we have come to the place where we have read and witnessed all kinds of evil stuff and the things that would draw the wrath of God. But in chapter 16, we come to... We want to read some of these. And then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Now we know that he, there had been seven vials of wrath and seven trumpets of wrath that had been poured out upon mankind, upon his creation. And, and here we come to seven more, but this is going to be the end of it. This is going to be the end of it. Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. And the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land. And ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had, had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. And it turned to blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing, thing in the sea died. And the third angel poured out the bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have, been, you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Then I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, True and just are your judgment. Then we come to the fourth angel, and he poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire, and they were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues. But look at it. Look at the next sentence. But they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowls on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And then, and then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs, and they came out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And these spirits of demons performed miraculous signs, and they go out of the kings to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of the God Almighty. Drop down to 17. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, that's it, it's done. Now I was hoping, I was hoping after the first bowl that was poured out, enough is enough, isn't it? When it is going to come to an end. But here we have that last angel saying, it is done. The seventh bowl it is done. Prophecy, when we're in prophecy, we read very often that the day is coming, the great and awesome day of the Lord, where the wrath of God is going to be displayed. We have that here, the great wrath of God displayed. What a display of wrath. And the hardness that has crept into the soul of man. It would seem that someplace along the line, man would have fallen all on his knees and said, God, I repent, but he would not. He would not. I think of a sermon that was preached many years ago. I didn't hear it. I wasn't there when it was preached. But it has been held in the archives, and I have read it. Uh, Daryl, you probably will know what I'm, who I'm talking about. Jonathan Edwards. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. You and I, you, and we have come so far from, from 
deleting the idea that God is an angry God, that there's a wrath to be considered and thought about. But this is it. There is wrath, there is a reason for God's wrath and it is coming. And here we are reading about it where it is going to come to an end. And, and uh, when you read through that, you come to the place where you, if you are like me, I am, boy, when is this going to end? And here we see that it will end. God will end it. But we must not forget we must not forget there is another place where, where we read about something that is finished. And I'll bet you you will know, recognize this right away. It's found in John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 28 and 29. And that is the story of the resurrection, or of the crucifixion. John chapter 19, verse 28, and later, knowing that all was now completed. <laughs> Look at it. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty, and a jar of wine and vinegar was there, so that he soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. What did he mean when he said it is finished? I've had enough? No, I don't think so. Matter of fact, I know so it wasn't. He had come to do a job and he had done it and he had done it satisfactorily. It was completed, it was done. Salvation had been achieved. But it required that salvation had, had been achieved, but it required meeting the wrath of God. Romans chapter, chapter 1, we uh, go to Romans chapter 1 and verse uh, 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppresses the truth by their wickedness. The wrath of God is revealed and it was revealed there in full force. And here we find out that the wrath of God for a certain group of people was satisfied. It was done. Here we see displayed the, full, the totality of man's sinfulness. The creator shaking his fist at the creator. And then we see wrath. The wrath of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was cried from the cross. Jesus cried that from the cross and, and heaven was stone silent. And I don't doubt for a moment that when, when God heard those words from his very own son, he would have wanted to break out there and uh, display his wrath to all of creation. But he had a job for his son to do and his son was going to do it and he was going to bear the wrath of his father so that uh, there would be a group of people that would be able to stand righteous before the God. Wow. No one Jesus said it is finished. He was not saying I've had enough. I'm done. I'm out of here. No, he was saying it is finished because that salvation that he and the Father had planned that so many, so in ages past would be completed. The wrath of God would be satisfied. Any man who would come to the cross and, and they would find their sins forgiven would be forgiven. The wrath would be done. We want to turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and... Actually... I want to read verse 10, 9 and 10. He's talking about in chapter 5. Let's read those verses. 
Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinning, God, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? It is finished. Brothers and sisters, on the cross, the wrath of God was done for anybody and everybody that came to him in faith. That is why we rejoice this morning. I like this song. I'm not sure the name of the song, but it goes something like this. Sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. Sin not in part, but in whole, but the whole is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. What is the name of that song? It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. And Jesus said, it is done. If you have believed on the, uh, for, for your salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calgary, and when Jesus said, it is done, it is finished, you know it is finished. You ain't going to add anything to that, to that salvation. No, you ain't. It is done, and it is done well. And for closing, we want to turn back to Revelations. Revelation and the scripture that, that uh, Jake read for us. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first First earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautiful, dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Oh, I like this. Now, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death and no mourning and no crying or pain and for the old order of things has passed away. That, what we experience on this earth, all that is done, it is passed away. Of course that is for the believer. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Write this down. It is done. It is done. And we're waiting with anticipation for the hope that we have. The new heaven and the new earth. It is done. And with that, my sermon is done. Dietrich, would you lead us in a song?
Thank you, Dennis, for a message of hope. You know, I mean, we need this this kind of hope as Christians. We need reassurance that God is for us. Uh, the song that I've chosen to, to finish is Victory in Jesus, the hymn book number 240. That's where we have the victory. 240.